disciples with the promise of the Holy Spirit, and they were assured by the blessing that thou art the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a huge blessing to have both Father John and Father Matthew uh, tonight to uh, have a bit of a, what we call as a panel discussion, and the intent of these uh, panel discussions are for us just to give a little bit of snippets. We really want uh, your interaction as much as possible, not just for the for these panel discussions, uh, but in general. Um, if it's possible uh, prior to coming to the homily, if you can do a little bit of your own reading, at least the epistle or gospel reading, just so we have a point of reference, because uh, we should be taking it to the next level where we're getting more input from you, because in order for us to be able to gauge uh, your interest level, if you give input, then we give a better idea of what we can prepare for you. So um, tonight, God willing, we're going to speak about a little bit about uh, this coming feast of the of Pentecost and the, the Holy Trinity, Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'm just going to read uh, to start off the for, for Pentecost in the Book of Acts, chapter two, verses one to eleven. Small discussion there, and then uh, Father John, and Father Matthew will go from that part. And while the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled. They were all with one accord in the same place. And suddenly there came to be a sound out of, of the heaven, like as of a violent wind going along. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of a fire being distributed. And it sat upon each one of them. And they were fi all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, even as the Spirit was giving them to utter. And there were Jews abiding in Jerusalem, pious men from every nation of those under the heaven. And the report of this having arisen, the multitude came together and was confounded because they were hearing each one of them speaking in his own dialect. And they were all amazed and wondering, saying to one another, Behold, all these who are speaking are Galileans, are they not? And how do we each hear in our own dialect in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and those who dwell in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, also Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya, which are in the region of Cyrene, and the Romans, both Jews and proselytes, who sojourn here, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the magnificent works of God. That's where it stops, and it goes a little bit further there. So we see from this part of the scripture. And I really like this translation, specifically one word in this translation, dialect. Right? Because when they spoke, it's not just important that they hear in their own language, but in their dialect, because God knows that people, if they don't hear it in the way that they understand the language, then it's very difficult for them to come to the knowledge of the faith. And that's why it's imperative, a moral and spiritual imperative here in North America and some of you may not agree with me, and that's fine, I'm not infallible, that we need to be using more of the lingua franca, the language of the people, right? which in this North America is English, so that the gospel can be spread. If we don't share a faith, we can't spread a faith. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful section of scripture, and um, of course, something that's another imperative that we do is when we do read, and it's one thing I like about the Orthodox uh, Study Bible, the New Testament, uh, that it has... Um, brief but very useful interpretations from the Holy Fathers, right? So I'm going to share a few of them with you, and then hopefully uh, the Fathers will jump in. So St. John the Chrysostom says the following, While the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, that is, not before the Pentecost, but about the time of it, what is this Pentecost? The time when the sickle was able to be put to the harvest and the ga and gathering of the fruits was made. So we're talking there in the physical realm, as our Lord also you know, used the physical realm to reveal spiritual truths. And we see here now how God is gathering right, 
all of the peoples from all the different parts of the world and in their dialect to speak to them, to gather them to the church. Second part, St. John Christum is commenting upon, like as of a violent wind borne along. Observe how it was always, as it says, like as, and rightly, that you may have no gross sensible notions of the Spirit. It says, as of a violent wind. This betokens the exceedingly vehemence of the Spirit, but it was not a wind. And the third and last part, it's a big section here, but I think it's very useful. Tongues as of a fire. Right? Because unfortunately, when uh, the average, uh, even Orthodox, unfortunately, but the average person in the world, when they think about Pentecost and speaking in tongues, they think about somebody that's having a seizure at best, if not worse, uh, other things. So it's very important that we do understand what does it mean? What did the church always understand and experience when it speaks about tongues as of a fire? This is from St. Gregory the Great. Why did the Holy Spirit appear thus? The Spirit, who is co-eternal with the Father and the Son, was revealed thus because God is an immaterial and indescribable and invisible fire, as Paul testifies. Our God is a consuming fire. God is called fire because he consumes the rust of sin. That's why oftentimes we partake of Holy Communion on a regular basis. We should hopefully at some time experience, even on a very peewee level, the fire within us. Of this fire, truth, Christ, said, I came to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish that it was it were already kindled. Right? So when people read that out of context, <laughs> they want to, to burn the earth. Right? That's why, again, you must interpret Scripture according to the Holy Fathers. The Scriptures are holy. And they must be interpreted according to the Holy Fathers. The Spirit is co-eternal with the Son, and the tongue has the closest connection to, with the Word. Since a Word is produced by a tongue, the Spirit appeared in tongues because whoever is touched by the Holy Spirit confesses the Word of God, His only begotten Son. So that's why when we hear other tongues, whether it be other I don't want to call them denominations, but other confessions. We know that they're speaking the truth, that they're confessing the full truth. One who possesses the tongue of the Holy Spirit cannot deny the word of God, or the Spirit appeared in uh, sorry, or the Spirit appeared in the tongues because he causes all, he fills both to burst on the Sunday Vespers when the prayers are read uh, to the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Teachers possess fiery tongues because when they preach out of love for God, they inflame the hearts of their hearers. And that was the experience the apostles and others had when they heard Christ speaking to them, right? Fire within them. The man who said, our heart was burning in us as he was speaking to us in the way and as he was opening up to us the scriptures, was it not? Same thing with the bonafide spiritual fathers, that fire will be kindled within us. Receive this fire of teaching from the mouth of the truth himself. The Holy Spirit had to be manifested over the disciples as fire so that spiritual passion might rouse them against themselves, these men who were merely human beings and therefore sinners. Then through repentance, they would punish in themselves the sins which God was sparing through his gentleness. And that also appe uh, appeals to us as well, right? That we... Hopefully, as we're starting to experience God, hopefully we're having a severe, even a small experience, and when we feel that fire, the love of God within us, we want to want to put away our passions. It's not worth it right? to exchange anything for God. We must always consume our sins with the fire of repentance. So I'm going to stop right there. There's a lot more, right? But I just wanted to give those little snippets there that we have a place to begin our discussion hopefully tonight. Father Matthew, Father John? I guess, okay, I'll, I can begin then. Father Matthew's not ready. Okay. You, would you like me to begin, Father? Is that... Okay. Go ahead. Um, I thought then what I'd talk a little bit about tonight, very, very briefly, in, in a very sort of introductory form, uh, would be sort of the, as I've done on the previous feast, I guess, uh, a little bit about sort of the theological significance of the Feast of Pentecost as well as its uh, soteriological significance. And when we speak about soteriology, what we're talking about is our salvation, 
how does the Feast of Pentecost uh, influence human salvation? And so we'll uh, talk a little bit about those two things uh, before I hand it over to Father Matthew. Um, the first thing we should sort of take into consideration about the Feast of Pentecost is that it falls roughly 50 days, of course not roughly, but 50 days uh, after Pascha and about 10 days after the Ascension. Um, Pentecost, of course, comes from the Greek word Peninda, which is 50, so you can see the connection there. Um, this great event, like all the great events associated with our salvation, uh, was dimly foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So when we think back to the Old Testament and the number 15 particularly, I think one event sort of sticks out to us particularly. And this is that 50 days after uh, the Jews had been delivered from slavery to the Egyptians, uh, Moses ascends to Mount Sinai. And of course, on the peak of Mount Sinai, he receives the Ten Commandments uh, from God himself. Uh, these commandments, as important as they are to sort of the salvation of humanity and the particularly the preparation of humanity for the saving gift offered to us in Christ, um, we have to remember that these Ten Commandments were teachings. They were things offered externally. Uh, they were external guidance offered to the Jews to prepare them uh, in the way of righteousness. And so this was but a shadow of what was to come uh, in the future event in the event which this thing uh, sort of foreshadows. At Pentecost, as we just read in the epistle, uh, which Nico read for us, we heard that all were met together in one room. This all that the scriptures is speaking of are the about 120 followers of Christ uh, that were living at that time. So we have the apostles, the Theotokos, of course, the myrrh-bearing women, and the remaining disciples. Uh, once these were all gathered together, there was a great noise, which sounded, as Nico pointed out, like a powerful wind from heaven. At which moment, shortly thereafter, all of these people were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is something really important and noteworthy which we have to, have to take into consideration here. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have God take up dwelling within us or inside our heart, is something very different than having God speak to us externally as a teacher or offer sort of guiding helps as was done in the Ten Commandments. Uh, this sort of filling with the Holy Spirit is something altogether new and different and offered for the first time at Pentecost. And it's in fact in this filling that uh, the greatness of the Feast of Pentecost is shown to us. So we know all that Christ did, his coming down from heaven, his suffering, his death on the cross, his resurrection, he did in order to reconcile God and man. To make it possible, in other words, for God and man to be joined together, to live together as they had lived in the Garden of Paradise until sin had entered and transgression had torn them apart. However, in a certain sense, with all this that Christ had done for us, for our salvation, it was like he'd prepared the medicine, but there was yet, as, as at that time, no way of applying the medicine to humanity. And thus, just before his ascension, Christ says to his disciples, it is for your own good that I go away, because unless I go, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, in other words, will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. So it is in the coming of the Holy Spirit that his saving mission is made complete, that the medicine which Christ prepared for us on the cross and through his suffering uh, is sort of administered to us, and we're made capable of being united to God. We are, we are actually able to be united to God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then in addition, it is through the coming uh, of the Holy Spirit that we also receive all the blessings that are associated with this reconciliation. It's through this that they're all given. So when we hear the Vespers hymns, for instance, on Saturday night coming, we'll hear the Holy Spirit gives all things. It makes prophecies flow. It prote uh, perfects priests. It taught the unlettered wisdom. It revealed fishermen to be a theologians. And it welds together the institution of the church. And so on the one hand, we have this sort of uh, significance in terms of our salvation of Pentecost, because in the coming of the Holy Spirit, we're able to be, uh, those things Christ did for us are able to be brought home to us. They're able to become part of us uh, through the Holy Spirit's coming to dwell in us. And at the same time, we are also opened uh, to all the gifts 
that are a natural outpouring of this union between God and man. And so that's what I had to say as a way of an introduction to sort of the feast. Uh, Father Matthew, if you want to take over from there. Sure. Um, it seems uh, the panel's working out nicely this evening, I think, because um, we have Nico beginning with uh, the scriptures and giving us some futuristic commentary. We have Father John sort of summing up the sort of overarching theological and uh, significance and for our salvation. And uh, most of the things that I sort of focused on this evening in terms of preparing a few notes, I guess, um, had to do mainly with the hymnology. And I decided to kind of um, focus a little bit on that, uh, to draw that aspect out of it. Interestingly, Father John just read you the quote for the first hymn that I was going to, uh, uh, to quote to you about the Holy Spirit gives all things. And uh, the re I was going to quote that because I wanted to make the point that I think this feast in particular, I don't know how many of you, you know, uh, read over the, uh, or have been reading over the uh, the Vespers or the Matins hymns uh, for these Sundays that we've had. You can find them online. But um, but I, what I noticed, especially when going through this one again, is just how clearly the, the hymns of this particular feast actually interpret for us exactly how we're meant to understand the events that uh, that Nico was reading for us in the scriptures. And, uh, and it struck me that it did this more so, uh, that it, it actually stands out how much it, it sort of makes clear what is going on with Pentecost. And so as we heard with Father John, that hymn from Vespers, the Holy Spirit gives all things, and then it gives a list uh, of how that is and welds together the whole institution of the church. But um, there's, there are some other sort of uh, very instructive hymns, and, and particularly actually the readings from the Old Testament that are appointed for, uh, f uh, for Vespers. I thought uh, they, they did, they were sort of a very clear illustration of what is happening in this feast, but unlike the sort of, sort of normal pattern where um, the New Testament and the, and the hymnology really sort of interprets the Old Testament events, and Father John even mentioned some of those in describing Pentecost and uh, and the way that it was celebrated and its uh, and some of its connection with Moses and things like that. Um, but what we find in the readings, I, I, which struck me so much, was the way in which these Old Testament readings really interpret very clearly for us this New Testament event in a way that I think we don't um, always see. Uh, and so it was sort of an interesting reversal, I thought. And uh, so maybe I'll just um, read you a few, uh, a little bit from this first reading for Vespers that's appointed from Numbers. The Lord says to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of the people, whom you know to be elders of the people and their scribes, and you shall bring to the tent of witness, and they shall stand there with you, and I shall come down and speak with you there, and I shall take of the Spirit which is upon you and place it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, and you shall not bear them alone. And it says that Moses gathers them together. And, uh, and the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to Moses. And he took of the spirit which was upon him and placed it upon the seventy men, the elders. But as the spirit rested upon them, they too prophesied in the camp. Uh, and then did so no longer. And it uh, tells about two men who weren't in the camp. And uh, Joshua, uh, or Jesus, the son of Nevi, if you're using the uh, Septuagint, good Orthodox Bible, um, runs up to Moses and says, Moses, stop them, you know, they're, they're prophesying. And, uh, and Moses sort of, I think, makes this sort of, um, says this line, which is well known, but applies to exactly what, we, what we're seeing going on in Pentecost. Moses says, why are you jealous for me? And who would not give that all the Lord's people were prophets whenever the Lord should put his spirit upon them? And so I think it's passages like this and, and specifically the earlier part where we actually see what, it, what happens. The spirit is literally taken and, and, uh, and, and is coming upon all of the elders so that they can do this. And I think um, it's things like this that sort of help to illumine, okay, what's exactly going on when these tongues of fire come upon them? Like it's... You know, the, 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 
the account in Acts, okay, we understand that they speak in new tongues and people can understand them praising God. Um, but I think from some of these readings, it's, it's sort of extremely clear. It's the Spirit of, the, of God coming upon them, the Holy Spirit, so that they too can become as prophets, as those who know and can deliver uh, reliably and faithfully uh, the Word of God. Uh, and we see sort of similar things in the, in the next two readings from the prophecy of Joel and the uh, prophecy, prophecy of Ezekiel in particular. The one from Ezekiel, we, we hear this, it's a very short one, but um, I shall take you from among the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land and I shall sprinkle pure water upon you and you will be purified from all your impurities and from all your idols and I shall purify you and I shall give you a new heart and I shall give you a new spirit and I shall take away the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I shall put my spirit in you and make you walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them and you shall dwell on the land which I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your God and so again here we see this is exactly what's going on forgive the background noise uh, um, exactly what's going on here is that in get, being given this new spirit uh, literally our heart is becoming something different something that it wasn't to the point that it's being compared initially to an inanimate object stone and has become life become a living and become flesh as the as the text actually says mm -hmm. and that that sort of spirit within us will help us to follow the commandments and so uh, this is you know I, I came back to the the scriptural sort of references but this is all throughout the hymnology for this feast and so I thought it was sort of um, I wanted to sort of point that out to you and you know if you haven't had a chance to sort of read over um, you know the the hymnology of the of the church you know go to a website like um, Anastasis .co.uk no .org.uk or something like that type in Anastasis and liturgical texts and uh, and go into you, you can find the liturgical text and you can click into um, into this and you can find this Sunday and you can read the text for it and uh, I would recommend you you know if you try to find some time to do that before him because it's very the hymns are very illuminating um, in terms of pointing out exactly um, how it is that we're supposed to understand what is happening in Pentecost. I'll point out one more small example to you and then you know we'll keep going but um, a very well-known hymn that we hear very often at the end of liturgy we have seen the true light we have received the heavenly spirit we have found the true faith as we worship the undivided trinity for the trinity has saved us and so it, it struck me again here we have uh, presented precisely uh, through this hymnology uh, what we're experiencing because this Sunday the Pentecost Sunday we actually celebrate the Holy Trinity and on Monday we celebrate the Holy Spirit and in this small hymn that we com continually repeat uh, throughout the year uh, we have this sort of reference to the steps by which a person comes to know God I think um, we see the first part we have seen the true light now if we go back to the gospel for the Sunday we have Christ saying I am the light of the world so we have seen the true light that is Christ we have received the heavenly spirit which is the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as we've just recorded and thereby we have found the true faith uh, and what is that true faith well worshiping the undivided Trinity for the Trinity hath saved us but this connection by which we come to know God that it's by coming to know Christ who then pours forth the Holy Spirit upon us and it's through uh, their actions working within the the heart that has moved from stone to flesh that we are actually able to find the true faith and I would even go so far as uh, to say to understand the true faith in the sense that until that moment um, until the Holy Spirit dwells within us we uh, a person can't truly understand what it means to worship the undivided Trinity nor to understand uh, to understand that faith and so um, that would be sort of the the side of things I think I would focus on in terms of understanding this 
Um, but also, it, you know, it certainly connects to all the things that you know Father John was drawing out as a as an overview. And you'll see those themes if you're paying attention uh, as you read through the uh, the hymnology. I don't know if someone has comment on that or uh, Father Matthew. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. You know, um, the, the perfect uh, segue with what you're talking about the hymnology of the church. Because if you look at the the epistle for for Pentecost, sorry for um, for the Monday of the Holy Spirit for Holy Trinity, uh, it's from the Ephesians, and there's a, I'm not going to read the whole part. You have to I can't spoon feed you all night. Well, mm -hmm. at least those things that you can find yourself. But um, there's a beautiful interpretation from Blessed Jerome on the part where where it talks about you know that we should be chanting you know in hymns and spiritual songs as we say Salmis ki imnis ki odes primatikes. And he says the following, why it's so important for us to understand the hymnology. And he says the following, Our hymns declare the strength and majesty of God. They express gratitude for his benefits and his deeds. Our psalms convey this gratitude also, since the word Alleluia is either prefaced or appended to them. Right? How many times do we say Alleluia in the church? Or Kiri Lais, another of those, you know, um, not vain repetitions, you know spiritual repetitions of, of gratitude. Our psalms properly belong to the domain of ethics, teaching us what is to be done and avoided. The domain of the psalms in, is the body of an instrument of grace. But the domain of the spiritual canticles, of chanting, is in the mind. And if we chant or we sing spiritual canticles, we hear discourses on things above. Right? So that's why it's very important Father Matthew and Father John tonight, you know, just giving us even small little snippets of the hymnology because our, our hymnology, a beautiful homily Father Seraphim Rose gave about the hymnology from the Fathers, of, I'm pretty sure it was the First, first Ecumenical Council, it's a the theology woven from on high. You know, the, 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 the theology that we have, the hymnology that we have, is not man-made. It's man's synergism with the Holy Spirit to convey things from on high to us, right, who are down here on low. The domains of the Psalms is the body of, as an instrument of grace, but the domain of the spiritual canticles is the mind. As we sing spiritual canticles, we hear discourses on things above, on the harmony of the world, on the suddenly ordered a concord of all creatures. These spiritual songs help us to express our meaning more plainly for the sake of simple folk. Right? Because when Christ spoke, he spoke to the level of the people. So it's very important that we also do this. It doesn't mean simplistic. It doesn't mean, uh, um, you know, base. It means understood. So yeah, if, I can, if I can interject here. Yeah, please do, uh, please do. You know, just to that point exactly. Um, you know, look how much time uh, we take in order to talk about these themes. And yet the Holy Fathers are summing them up in our hymnology in a matter of four lines. You know, the kind of, uh, you know, preparation or rather, in this case, inspiration that that requires is just uh, incredible. And it's by following their path, right? Because that's what's very important, that we follow their path, that we will end up at the same, you know, destination they had, right? Mm. Here's something very beautiful, it's something we need to pay particular attention to, especially, if, forgive me, I can bash my own because I'm Greek, the chanters, right? These spiritual songs help us express our meaning more plainly for the sake of civil folk, it is more with the mind than with the voice that we sing offering psalms and praise God. Right? It's not a place to show off. Right? It's not, forgive me for saying this, Dalara at the Psaltiri. Right? Sorry, he's a famous Greek singer at the chanting stand. Right? It's for, the chanter is to help people pray. And that's why in the Greek we actually don't say, I sing in church. It's a different word, tragudao which comes from tragos, and I won't go there too far, but pselno, right, which means I'm chanting, which means I'm praying, traditionally speaking, right? So the chanter in the church, when he is, uh, is chanting, or the choir that's chanting, Byzantine choir, <laughs> is to help the people lead into prayer, and the, and the word of, uh, we say in Greek, katanixi, to come to some spiritual awakening, to help people to, with repentance, right? Because in the liturgies, in all of the services, we're glorifying God. And that's what we're doing, God willing, we're, through his mercy, saved in paradise. 
So if we're not experiencing that within the church, other than blaming the, the chanters, we'll be lo looking within ourselves. And one last part from change, Saint John the Christmas time with the same part: learn to chant. We say that to everyone with order. And thou shalt see the delightfulness of the employment, which is meant by singing and chanting in your heart to the Lord. Adon des, kipsalon des in the cardia imon to kirio. It means with understanding and attention. That includes reading of the Psalms. You know, when, when you, if you're a reader in the church or a chanter in the church, right? You're not reading for your own ears. <laughs> you're reading for the others to understand. So we have to be very careful when, when, when we read, to read as clearly as possible. For those who give no heed, merely sing, uttering words while their heart is roaming elsewhere. And this is scary because at times we experience this. We experience both sides, right? When we see a person that is you know, struggling in the faith and they chant, you feel it. Even if necessarily the voice isn't too good, whereas somebody might have a beautiful voice, but their heart's roaming elsewhere. Right? Even they go even further, for, for, for chanters, there are canons, meaning church directives, for lack of a better expression, on the lifestyle of a chanter and how he should be living his life. It's the first step into the priesthood. That's where a, a ordained chanter wears the raso. Right? Just some things to, to consider, that things aren't just there for chance, right? Everything within the church has a meaning. Father John, Father Matthew, if you want to step in again. I think we can just push it a little bit further then. We're, we seem to be going in a good direction here anyway. Um, I think the next step is what we're beginning to say. Okay, we've talked about sort of the significance of the, the Holy Spirit sort of being poured out on the earth uh, as the way of sort of uh, applying to ourselves that which Christ has done for us on the cross and our salvation. It's, it's the means by which salvation penetrates the heart and transforms the human being. Um, there's a next logical question which I think comes from that. Uh, if we look back again to the Pentecost hymns or some of the hymns we hear, the famous hymn sort of associated with Pentecost, most probably most easily associated with Pentecost, is Vasilev Oranya, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present. Um, so the Church is reminding us when we sing this hymn over and over again, that yes, indeed, the Holy Spirit, this transformative agent, uh, this agent of our salvation has been poured out over the whole of the earth. The gift of salvation has been made real. Um, the other hymns of the Church talk about this as being the final feast, because this is the feast which perfects our movement towards salvation. All of a sudden we have the capability of salvation being applied to the human heart. Um, but nonetheless, okay, the Holy Spirit has been poured, up out, of, uh, poured out upon the earth. And St. Philaret of Moscow, uh, in one of his homilies on Pentecost, raises, I think, a, the really important question for us practically in all of this. Uh, he says, if this treasure is so near and indeed so accessible, why is it so rare and so little known? What he is not asking here, he's not asking us, why are there so few that find Christianity? But rather he's asking us, I think, an even more important question. Why is it that so few Christians fulfill their calling, become temples of the Holy Spirit, and find salvation? And his answer to this, this sort of basic question is simple. Um, and you know what, I don't think I'm going to answer it. I'm going to put that out there as a question and see if we can get some discussion. Why is it that St. Philaret says, this treasure is so near and so accessible and yet so rare and so little known? First, is it so rare? I think that's an important question for us. Do we think salvation is a difficult thing and so few find it? Um, but then why, if, if we think that, they do, that, uh, that so few find it, why is it that so few find it? Anyone want to take a step? Well, the question is, is it rare? Do you believe that within the body of the church, right, the Orthodox Church, that people find salvation? Right? Is it something that's a rare experience, or is it something that happens? The more... That's the... Go ahead. Well, I... Remember, I asked the same question to my spiritual father, 
and two things he said to me. The first thing he said to me, uh, something about the narrow gate. And the second thing he said to me, he looked at me and he said, not everyone's going to be saved. Some We have to come to the realization that some people amongst us are not going to make it. It is what it is, right? Okay. Anyone else want to offer their perspective? Like that here? Your blessing, Father. Lord bless. Uh, uh, because we simply refuse to do the will of God and follow Him and keep His commandments and, and live uh, according to the way He's taught us to live, uh, we misuse our free will. Yeah, that, I think that's hitting the nail pretty much right on the head. Um, in terms of uh, St. Philaret's precise answer, uh, he says that our uncleanness is, in essence, a dam which separates us from the flood of the living water of the Spirit of the Lord. So to put it sort of even, even more synoptically, even though what you said I think is excellent, he synopsizes it down to uncleanness or impurity. <coughs> The fact that we're not living a pure life, well, what does that mean? If we're not living a pure life, it means we're not living according to the gospel. We're not living the, the gospel of Christ, and we're not showing him forth in our life. Um, we have to remember, as Orthodox Christians particularly, um, that we don't believe that we're all saved just by virtue of having faith, or even by virtue of having some desire for salvation, uh, the sort of Protestant notion of justification by faith. If I just think or desire it hard enough, God is just going to give it to me. This isn't what we believe as Orthodox Christians. We don't believe in justification by faith. We believe, as the Holy Apostle James says, uh, faith without works is dead. We need to be doing things for our salvation. Um, and thus we need to sort of seek after the kind of purity that, that uh, St. Philaret and, and obviously Christ of the Gospel is calling us to. Um, to put it, I guess, even in another way, if we're to take the divine medicine of our salvation, which is made for us by Christ, and then offered to us through the Holy Spirit, we must at least open our mouths for him, for him to put it in. Uh, that is, we have to create the condition within our souls which can receive the Holy Spirit, and we do this by living in a manner which is befitting of Christians. And that is a life of purity. Um, go ahead, Father. Yeah, no, I, I think... Uh just to uh, on what you're saying, the sort of it's not just too that we we believe or we you know we want to uh, we really want it or something like that, um, but equally it's not just enough that because we were baptized, you know, lots yeah. of people can fall into this thing. I was baptized and you know my family's Orthodox and I've been Orthodox my whole life, you know, it, it doesn't make a difference if we don't put our faith into practice, which is sort of where Father John is is um, going with that point. Um, you know, I, I like to think of it as baptism is like the uh, the membership card to the gym. Just because you bought a membership doesn't mean you got in shape. Yeah. You know, it requires effort. It requires work, um, and it's it's exactly the same thing with the life of the church. That being said, uh, what I wanted to add to what Father John was just saying also is that we also can't get confused to think just because we um, you know follow the gospel just because we um, we do all you know we read the Bible or something like that or that a person reads the Bible um, who hasn't received holy baptism for example that uh, that they're just going to be okay as well you know there's two parts to to the to the coin as it were two sides to the coin one is in holy baptism and be, may, being made members of the body of Christ we're given the capability then to become transformed, to become vessels of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, that's not where we stop. That isn't enough for salvation, but it's necessary. It's a necessary step uh, along the way because I think we can easily fall into. Uh, well, I don't know what we fall into exactly, but um, w by falling into this, well, this person's a good person or that person's a good person. Um, my professor of theology often said that one of the first questions he would, without a doubt, always be asked is, can the non-Orthodox be saved? And he would constantly respond, the only reason why you're asking, can the non-Orthodox be saved, is because if they can be saved, 
you know, being outside of the church, then you for sure, who are inside the church, must, you're definitely going to get in then. <laughs> and it had more to do with her reflection on, on themselves uh, rather than it had to do with a, a genuine concern for, um, you know, the souls of these people or, or something like that. It's not that in every case, but his point was, and he would often say this, we need to worry about our own salvation. You know, we only ask a question like that because we think we're going to be safe. When the boat starts sinking, you know, and we're in the water and we're drowning, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we're, we're thinking about trying to find some way to save ourselves, to keep our head above water, to find some kind of life raft. We're not thinking about the people all around, of, uh, all around us. And um, anyway, like we don't want to go too far with that analogy, but the point being we do need to be – we. it's not just that there's lots of people around us that aren't going to be saved. We should be afraid ourselves. I'm the one that's not going to be. I'm the one that people are going to say, wasn't it a shame about so-and-so? Um, and when we start to believe that, then we can start, I think, to 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 live a little bit more intentionally. Yeah, and that's that's uh, another another segue again, because you know when the fathers say, "Keep your mind in Hades and despair not," right? Yes. That's, that's exactly the the spirit of it, right? So that yes. if we, for lack of a better expression, in our minds, we contemplate that we're already in Hades and then work backwards, right? Yeah. It's okay, so I'm in Hades, so what do I need to do to escape here and, and live that kind of lifestyle, then th things will change, right? And, and that's where it starts, right? If I can add real quickly again back to what Father John started off with the, the hymn to the Holy Spirit, Heavenly King, O come for the Spirit of Truth, who are pre uh, present and fill us all things. O treasure every good bestower of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain. Yeah. Right? Which is why it's you know the, the, the one of my most favorite prayers, the prayers in, on, on Pentecost. You know the the vespers. Uh, it's the only Sunday traditionally that we kneel on, so it's vespers, so it doesn't really count as a full Sunday. But you know that that we ask the Holy Spirit to clean us, to clean us, because how can the holy and pure God dwell within us if we're not clean? And what's the process of what's the process of cleaning, right? The entry, the beginning, the baptism that we receive, right? And then afterwards is through confession and repentance, right? Does the Father say one tear of repentance equals the baptismal form? Because that what was the whole point of all of this, you know, this final feast that they the Orpi is for the beginning of the apostolic work, right? to preach the gospel, to baptize, to offer confession, because everyone, right, after that baptism, at some point, will sin at different levels. Right? No one is without sin even after baptism. And how do we get back to the baptismal state? Through confession and repentance, right? And the receiving of Holy Communion to keep that fire within us, right? So it's a whole, there's a whole methodology, a whole system, that Christ has set up for us for our salvation, right? So I just wanted to mention that real quickly. Father John, for the Matthew, if you want to step in again. Hello, John. <laughs> okay. We can go. I mean, I, I've got further to go, but if there's things you want to say, Father, just... Uh, well, I'll ahead. just, you know, I'll just jump in on you like I just did, so... <laughs> That's probably for the best. Okay, um, so I guess the, the next question then is sort of in a practical direction. We've hit on some of these things already. Um, we've established that, look, the Holy Spirit only can come to dwell in us if we've created the conditions for it to come and enter in and uh, be a part of our life, and more than that, to actually unite us to God. And that's why Pentecost is so significant for our salvation, because it's through the Holy Spirit that God comes to dwell in us, and that's our salvation, being united again with God as we were in paradise. And so um, the next question for us then is, what do we actually do? We know it's this impurity that scares the Holy Spirit away in a certain sense and casts it out of our lives so that this, this uh, saving reality that's being offered to us uh, can't get into our hearts. Um, but what can we do sort of practically? What are the kinds of things we do practically uh, to call the grace of the Holy Spirit towards us um, so that instead of it being surrounding us on the outside, and guiding us from external things, we can come to sort of dwell in our hearts and, and we uh, uh, experience sort of the salvation that will be ours in paradise and a foretaste here. Um, 
the first thing that I that I sort of had an idea of talking about a little bit was just uh, the basic thing that we've said over and over again. The first thing we can do to acquire the Holy Spirit or to make ourselves a, a fitting temple of the Holy Spirit is to live in accordance uh, with Christ's law, to live the Christian life, to live a life pleasing to Christ and in accordance with the gospel. Um, now it's impossible for us to live this life if we don't know anything about it. That's just a fact. If we don't know anything about it, how the heck are we going to do it? Um, this means we need to take practical steps to learn what it is Christ wants from us in this life and how we need to live. That means we need to be studying the scriptures daily. We need to be studying the scriptures daily. Um, if we don't have the example of Christ set before us continually, how are we going to know how to live our life in a manner that's pleasing to him? He's given us the example in the, in the Gospels. All we have to do is sit down and read a little bit every day to sort of have it begin to penetrate our lives and have that image before our eyes constantly, our spiritual eyes constantly. Um, so the first thing we need to do is, yeah, constantly read the scriptures. Constantly read the scriptures. Um, there's really no excuse. I've yet, I should, I'll say it this way, I have yet to hear a valid excuse as to why one doesn't have time to read the scriptures every single day. And I've heard excuses, even for myself, but I've yet to hear a valid one. Um, if we're not in the habit of doing it, let's start doing a little bit and do it daily. But do something. Because like we said before, unless we know the path, through learning, through sort of observing Christ, how the heck are we going to put it in practice? There's absolutely no way. We need to learn things like the Ten Commandments so that we actually know them. Uh, or even, you know, know which book of the scriptures they're in at least or something. Because these are also a guide for us that are useful. Now, particularly even with the Ten Commandments, we can go a step further and say to make them even more useful for us, we can read the Holy Father's commentaries on the Ten Commandments. Because, for instance, even St. Uh, St. Gregory Palamas writes a beautiful commentary on the Ten Commandments. Uh, he calls it the New Testament Decalogue, where he describes uh, what the Ten Commandments look like in a Christian life. Um, so that's the first thing. We need to live a Christian life. We need to live the gospel. But to do this, the first step for us is really to sit down and try to learn, okay, what is it Christ wants from us? How, what does the Christian life look like? And then start trying to apply it to our lives. Now, just to add to what Father John is saying as well, um, you know, I, I think we should also, you know, you have a Bible like uh, Nico has there, the, um, I think it's Holy Apostles Convent, the New Testament, with, uh, with a lot of good patristic commentary uh, in the back, or footnoted on, on different paragraphs. You have the, the work of commentary in the Gospels that I held up to you a few weeks back, mm -hmm. Blessed Theoflact mm -hmm. of Urid. Um, all of these things are also great companions because it's, again, this way we can sort of guarantee that we are uh, understanding the scriptures rightly. But even beyond that, you know, we get to start to glean the real depths that uh, exist there. And so it's not like you need to read the entire gospel every day that you pick it up or something. You know, uh, it's important, I think, to do, especially when you're studying scripture, um, to do it in tandem with some of these works. I mean, there's obviously longer works that ha that uh, we have commentaries on all of the uh, Gospels and Epistles, but these short works, which are often included in the same volume, are in some ways ideal if you can sort of commit yourself to, to reading a little bit of both uh, yeah. at the same time. I, I forget which father, the Mount Athos, uh, had said this, I forget who it was, um, said that when when you read the scriptures, God is speaking to you. And when you pray, you're speaking to God. And you become, he actually said in Greek, you become best philarakia. You can become best buddies, right? So in order to, you know, to get to know somebody, you have to learn about them, and you have to speak with them. And that's what happens when we do these daily readings. And there'll be, a, there'll be well, I think we have to also remember, there's going to be a struggle. See, it's something that we, we forget about times. When you go to open the scriptures, all these thoughts are going to come to you, right? We have to be prepared for that battle. We have sometimes a misinterpretation, a misunderstanding that you know the Christian life is all beautiful. You know, you open the Bible, it's all la 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 la. No, the diablo. Like we forgot about the diablo, right? There's a, there's an evil one, who's the enemy of our salvation. So we have to put in our minds there's going to be battles. So we have to set up a program with our spiritual father. Of course, 
what is a good program for us to begin? When should I be reading the scriptures? Or if I have these temptations, what can get me to begin to read the scriptures? Right? So I just wanted to add that for the, for the method. Well, well, just I'll add one thing to what you're saying there too. You know, uh, you know, while the ideal thing is, especially when we read the scriptures, to, you know, to sit down with our Bible in a quiet place at a particular time that's sort of set out for us. You know, I think sometimes this is why people let these kinds of things slide, because they say, "Well, I don't have time," or "I woke up a little bit late, so I didn't get to do my routine," or whatever. You know, better in in a certain sense that you have to do it on the fly, as it were. You know, there's a lot of applicate apps now for, for cell phones, for all of these kinds of things on your computer where, you know, even if you can't do it in the ideal way, you can at least still force yourself to do it, even if it's just on your 15-minute break, you're taking a minute to read the daily scripture readings, for example. You know, we don't want to stay there. We don't want to, you know, fall into sort of a habit of laziness in just doing it in those ways. But at the same time, you know, we... I think we often feel if I can't do it perfectly, then I can't do it at all, yeah. and that we definitely don't want to be into in that position, um, because what we'll find out is we'll just end up not doing it at all for most of the time. So, uh, you know, yeah, practice makes perfect, and of course, perfect practice actually makes perfect. But uh, this is what we do uh, when we keep on it as best we can. So just add that, you know, there's a lot, you know, there's, it's even easier, I think, to find time in our day because we all have phones or we all have computers, which means the scriptures are there for us. Sorry, Father John, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to continue in the same vein in terms of, uh, you know, I think all that's been said is very important. Um, but the, this is an absolutely vital thing. The reading of the scriptures is absolutely central to the life of, of Orthodox Christians. Uh, we can't let that go by the wayside because that's uh, that's our connection to sort of the gospel life, largely. Um, and those are the things that are going to sort of eat at our conscience. Uh, the other thing that I think is important too, to emphasize, as Father Matthew did, it's great to find these little commentaries uh, by people, uh, saints like St. Saint Theoflac, for example, simply because in a lot of situations, we have difficulty sort of applying uh, the moral aspects of the gospel. Um, we don't necessarily see how they fit or how what Christ is saying fits with our particular situation. And the fathers, um, because they've taken that step back, often will set up sort of multiple circumstances uh, where these sort of situations do apply. And so uh, as we read more fathers particularly, we get more of a sense of where these moral imperatives than things that Christ was teaching us actually apply to our lives. Um, so it's really important to be reading a, a, a swath of the Fathers as well, just for that sense as well, that they're going to teach us situations and circumstances where this sort of uh, gospel is, is sort of applicable to our life and how we should apply it. Um, so that was the first thing. Uh, we need to learn the Christian life, and then we need to, to, uh, we need to live the Christian life, and to live it we need to learn it. So that's the first point. The second point, when we fail in this task, we have to repent. And as we've said before, uh, repentance isn't just a matter of some sort of vague feeling of sorrow over sin. Repentance actually means sort of a burning desire for correction, or if we don't have it, trying to foster it, and at the same time, the running to the priest for absolution. I mean, this is an absolute necessary part of, uh, of our actual repentance. If we aren't seeking confession and we aren't seeking absolution, which is God's forgiving our sins through the through the epithelium of the priest, then we know we're not truly repentant. Um, remorse is not going to be enough for us. Without this absolution that we get through the priest, uh, which is God's forgiveness, the stain of sin is still on our soul, and this impedes the entrance of the Spirit into our, our inner spiritual life. Um, so that's the second thing, because I don't want to throw anything in there. Just as you were saying, like it, and it isn't just um, in, in confession and repentance. You know, it's not just the removal of the of the filth or the sin. You know, uh, even though that's the central point, but the actually the activity of doing it, of going to repent and of going to confession in, in particular, itself is an act of virtue, in the sense that we're cultivating the virtue of humility. You know, this is essentially sort of what's going on, and, you know, one might say this is part of why God has worked it 
so that we're accountable one to another because it's such an uh, an easy and effective means for the cultivation of humility, uh, the cultivation of obedience, and uh, to to a, a, an extent as well, but especially of humility. And so I think we can look on it and see us as uh, see ourselves as even making progress just not only because we're cleaning things out, it's not as though I guess what I want to say is, oh, I'm back to square one, I'm just cleaning out the garbage again, and then I'm just back to where I was before I did this thing or whatever. No, actually, because you flexed different muscles, spiritual muscles, these muscles of humility, uh, just by doing this. So you're actually not where you were before, you're ahead of where you were before, yeah. as it were. As a way to encourage ourselves, anyhow. That's why I, I want to put that. It's not just negative cutting off. It's also this positive of um, building up another aspect of our souls. Well, John, you want to continue? Yeah, sure. I mean, if there's nothing, do we want to check for questions or comments yeah. or anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah good point. Any, anyone... Father, this question is actually for Father Matthew. He was saying about the apps and uh, the. Uh, he mentioned something about the scripture. Okay, I have these apps and everything, and mm -hmm. so I try to read them every day. The problem is I don't always have access to the commentary, so I have this fear that whenever reading the scriptures, again, what Nico was saying about the logis me and the, everything, of falling into like the traps that we might fall into, like incorrect interpretations, um, delusions, or arrogance, or vainglory, or um, thinking we know it all, or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so w what do we do to... Uh, you know, I, I don't think we have... We, we shouldn't be afraid of the scriptures, you know. Uh, yes, we need to be sort of checking our human mind, as it were, but if we read the scriptures with humility, praying before we read them, you know, say a small prayer before you read them, you know, ask God to enlighten you, like these prayers we're saying, oh, Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, uh, you don't really have to worry. Yeah. Um, you know, and especially if you're trying to, to take the straightforward reading of the scriptures. Um, where you would become concerned is the same way you'd become concerned with anything is when you start to have a particular thought that starts lingering and sticking and is sticking in your mind. And those are the kinds, and that's just this kind of thought that you want to bring to your spiritual father or go and check with the Holy Fathers anyway. Um, so I, I guess I would just encourage you not to fall into the opposite temptation. You know, the Holy Scriptures themselves, the words of the Scriptures themselves, you know, um, are, you know, are in a way the presence of of God as well, um, just like venerating the icon is. And so, um, maybe if you think of approaching the Holy Scriptures as you approach the Holy Icon, you know, not to go too deep, but to show your to show God your love and humility and trying to learn more about Him, then I think you can be assured that God will will protect you. Yeah, if I could add, you know, because sometimes this is what happens when we read the scriptures, you know, a certain point might stick out to us. And sometimes, you know, and I'll, I'll share something with you, I have to thank God for a Jehovah's Witness. Because they were saying certain things to me a long time ago that was like, well, wait a second, there can't be two truths. Either they're right or we're right. So it forced me to go look at the fathers, right? So I, I thank him. It was awesome. Thank you very much for putting that horrible thought in my mind. So I had to go back to the Holy Fathers, and they cleaned it up. So sometimes these temptations that we have, they're actually, we've got to turn it on its head, right? Say, oh, oh, that's that's interesting thought, you know? What, the Holy Trinity? Three and one, one and three? What is all that? Let me go read the Fathers. What do the Fathers say, right? Because we, we're, we're, we're the benefactors, right? Like we, we don't have to do all that work. They did it all for us, right? It's, it's not only just gold, but it's like perfectly formed for any use that we have for spiritual benefit, right? So don't be afraid of that. It's a temptation. Grab the scriptures, read them. If a thought comes to you, jot it down. If it's predominant, like Father Matthew said, speak to your spiritual father, and look what the fathers say about these things, right? It's beautiful. It's like going through a harvest, and you find a rock. Well, you don't stop because it's a rock. You push it aside and keep plowing away to, to continue in your harvest. Yeah. 
because God sees our disposition, right? If we're exactly. like Father, Father Matthew and Father John saying, if we're just making these small attempts, right? Go back like a teacher with the with the, with the, with the, uh, with their pupils. If they see that the child, the pupil is just struggling, you know, the the, the, the teacher's so happy, right? And the teacher will do extra things, right? So here we have the teacher, right? The paracleto, the comforter, the spirit of truth. When he sees that we're making these mighty struggles, he will come. It's that it's that humility. He says, you know what? That of such of the horse, the poor little guy, he's struggling. I'm going to give him, right? And so we don't give the little that we have. That's when the big things don't happen. Let's do the small things, you know, alpha vita copsa pita, as we say in Greek, and the rest will come. Yeah, um, you know, to add to that, you know, to sort of dispel some fear about deception and stuff. I was translating a homily yesterday from a spiritual father in in Greece. I've quoted some of them before, Father Simeon. And uh, you know he he yeah he says it sort of very bluntly. Uh, who becomes deceived? Or who becomes deluded? He said the person who wants to. And I, I was very very striking the the kind of way that he put it, you know. And so I, again back to our our disposition. If we're trying to live the Christian life with humility. And we're especially if we're in obedience to our spiritual father, um, then we don't have to be afraid, you know. Um, and, and just the opposite, actually, we need to live with uh, with courage, with karagio. Think of all of the analogies in the New Testament about us being fighters, about us being warriors, about us putting on the armor uh, of God, and which are, Saint Paul specifically refers to the scriptures that they're part of that armor that we clothe ourselves in and so I don't think we need to be afraid as it were that the devil is somehow going to uh, uh, you know overcome us as it were we but we do have to be cautious we do have to have the proper discernment but we shouldn't be afraid as it were and not it not in that sense that's not the that's the wrong kind of fear the kind of fear we want is the fear of God and that fear of God leads to, uh, well, as one of the hymns, I, I pulled this hymn out, actually, that the fear of God uh, leads to purification. We often hear the pure, uh, fear of the God is the beginning of wisdom. And the fathers write lots on this topic. But in the hymnology for this feast, they say that the fear of God leads to purification. But that is not the fear of the demons. Um, it's, a, it's a totally... It's a it's a different kind of thing, and so again, I would just encourage you with the spirit of humility. Um, I don't, you don't have to be afraid. God is stronger than the, the demons, and the spirit that works in us is stronger than the demons. So, and He'll illuminate us if we trust in Him. Anyone else? Father John, you want to? continue? Yeah, I'll just continue briefly, and because uh, I think there's a few important points we do want to hit. Um, so what else do we do? We said we have to live live a God-pleasing life. We live a God-pleasing life by learning what it is to live a God-pleasing life and sort of use that to guide our life. Um, when we fail, we have to repent, and that means true repentance in terms of cultivating actual sorrow for our sins, the fact that we've distanced ourselves from God. This is where it's actually useful, I think, to think, to think deeply about what, what's going on at Pentecost and the approach of the Holy Spirit. Um, Sometimes when we have trouble sort of cultivating sorrow for our sins, if we actually start to think, you know what, when I did that, I chased the Holy Spirit away. Um, that's one of these thoughts that can sort of help us realize the sort of uh, sad condition we're in at times of the, or develop sorrow for some of the sins we've committed when we have trouble. It's like, you know, when I did that, I put something between me and God. God can't come into me because of this right now. And it's a way of sort of cultivating sorrow or reminding ourselves. And that will help push us to go to confession and, and sort of deal with the issue. Um, so a third thing, we have to pray. We have to pray that we be found worthy of salvation and of the coming of the Holy Spirit to take up residence within us. And this uh, is particularly what we're going to do uh, Sunday, in most cases probably immediately following liturgy. We'll do the, vesper, the kneeling vespers. Um, and if we read the prayers sort of carefully that are set out in the kneeling vespers, uh, we'll have all this sort of set out that what we're doing is we're, we're calling the Holy Spirit to come down, uh, to purify us so that we might be sort of a fitting temple. Um, and so prayer is also an important part of what we're doing. Finally, 
Uh, and this is important because it's one of the, the things that gets passed over sort of really frequently in our age. We, to have the Holy Spirit come to dwell within us, we have to guard our faith pure as well because that's part of what it is to be pure in soul. Part of what it is to be pure in soul is to have a pure faith, to keep our faith orthodox, to keep, to keep the right faith within our soul. Um, the Holy Spirit, who is truth, cannot bear falsity. It's one of the things that chases him away. So when we have things that are untrue within our thoughts, those affect the way that, that God is able to interact with us because we've put up a barrier. We've put up something that repels the coming of the Holy Spirit. Um, so if we believe false things, the Holy Spirit can find no place in us. Particularly, and uh, I think this is important, we have to have a right faith about who the Holy Spirit is himself. Uh, and this is clear if we look at the hymnology, uh, and I, I recommend you to do this, as Father Matthew and Nico have both said over and over again. It's important for us to read through the hymns, especially, you know, if something happens and we're not able to go to Vespers Saturday night, uh, but we're going to make it to Matins. Well, read the hymns from Vespers over so that you get an idea. One of the things that's hit over and over again in, Mat in Vespers and Matins for Pentecost is this right belief in the Holy Spirit. Um, the hymnography is affirming over and over and over again that the Holy Spirit is equal in honor, that he is equally God together with the Father and the Son. This is because uh, in antiquity there were heresies with regard to the Holy Spirit. There was one major heresy uh, forwarded by someone named Macedonius uh, who taught that the whole, just like Arius taught that the Word wasn't God, so Macedonius taught that the Holy Spirit wasn't God, that he was less than the Father and the Son. And so this was condemned at the Second Ecumenical Council. Um, on the same topic, it's also very important for us to note that the fundamental thing, one of the fundamental things, which separates the Orthodox Church from Western, Western uh, Christendom, from the other uh, confessions, is the West belief in the Filioque. That is, that the Holy Spirit proceeded not only from the Father, as we believe, but from the Father and the Son. And essentially, I mean, without going into a lot of detail, this is a doctrine which makes the Spirit less than the other two. The Father and the Son uh, have in common this sort of, uh, the, uh, the things come from them. The Holy Spirit doesn't have this. And so somehow he's less than them. Um, and so we have to keep this in mind too. That this, is, this is one of the temptations for us, uh, particularly when we see all the things that happened in Jerusalem and the sort of rapprochement between the, the Catholic Church and uh, the Orthodox hierarchy. This is a major impediment that stands between the Orthodox Church and Western confessions. It's a wrong belief about the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we have to keep in mind that when we have these wrong beliefs, these are things which impede the descent of the Holy Spirit into our lives, uh, and they have to be taken very, very seriously. And so just as there were ancient, ancient heresies uh, about the nature of the Holy Spirit, so there are modern heresies about the nature of the Holy Spirit. And if we're to get tied into those, we will ourselves repel the Holy Spirit out of our own lives. And now, just to add to what Father John is saying, if uh, you know, if we think that these are this is a small matter, what is it? Just these three little words and the Son. Well, uh, Saint Gregory Palamas makes clear that we shouldn't even under, we shouldn't even begin to have dialogue with uh, with Western Christians until they've removed that. Yeah. Uh, filioque from the creed. He says that's the starting point for us to even begin to have dialogue. Um, and half of the reason why was because it's a false teaching with the Holy Spirit, and the other half of the reason was simply because it went against the ecumenical councils even to add something to the creed. I mean, that's the kind of um, precision which the saints of the church look at these situations with. You know, that the addition to the creed itself was enough to not have dialogue, let alone that the addition that actually was put in was so significant. I mean, um, you know, w there could be additions that one could have made to the creed. For example, uh, you know, the ever virginity of the Theotokos or, uh, you know, different things like that. But the Father specifically did not put those things into the creed, even though, yes, we do believe them. Um, and it's not optional for us to believe them or not believe them, but because the creed was laid down and that the ecumenical councils of uphold that we will never add uh, anything to them 
in that sense. And so um, on these two fronts, we see that even these things that we today as modern people say, oh, these are just small things. Well, the greatest saints in our church and the ecumenical councils disagree with us if we take that view on, uh, on these topics. You know, and interesting Sorry. enough, uh, what did we celebrate just last week? The Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council. Yeah. And what, one of many things they discussed, they gave us the first half of the creed, right? They, they showed to us that Christ is perfect God. You know, the, the St. Spiridon revealing of the, of the Holy Trinity. And now what are we celebrating, God willing, this coming weekend or the week afterwards, right? The, what's the whole destination for all of us is to all become saints, all saints. It's, it's all connected, right? The feast, the festive calendar, right? The Artoloi on the festive calendar is to bring us, where Father John began all of this, is with for our salvation. All of these are tools for our salvation. So if we play around with these tools of salvation, what are we playing around with? Play with our around with our with our salvation. And, and just to to go to build just a little bit on what you said there with the first ecumenical council, you know we have this saying it doesn't matter one iota, and it's kind of a theologian's joke that the difference between orthodoxy and heresy was the one iota that isn't included in Omoousia. You guys are the omousion and omiousion, right? Christ in prophecy, one iota, one jot, one tittle, one iota should not be taken away from the word, right? And here we and, have. And, and that, that was the difference between orthodoxy and heresy, between right? the God man and just a man. Omousion, right, of the same essence, omiousion of a similar essence, one iota. Prokopi, sir, you have a question. You can bring the, the mic back there. Right? So, as they say, the devil's in the details. <laughs> um, when I when I first when I first was interested in ortho, uh, Christianity, uh, the person who sent me to the Orthodox Church was a Catholic, and he was a a monk in Rome, at a Roman at a um, U Ukrainian Catholic monastery, and he told me in the Vatican there's a there's a solid silver plaque with the creed uh, the right way, yeah. and it's stuck in a wall. Oh, that's the expression. It's the writings on the wall. Yeah, and he told he told me he said, "Don't bother going to a Catholic church. You got to go to a Greek church." Yeah. And I got back. To, yeah, thank God. God. Yes, I think it was Saint Gregory. It was Saint Gregory the Theologos that put the plaque up with the right in gold yeah. and silver, right, or something in the. And and I'm even, still working. Believe, on, and, yeah, even earlier they were put together by uh, some popes to confess the or, the Orthodox version of the creed, but. I'm still working on him, and his bishop told me not to talk to me anymore. <laughs> ah, pray. Uh, yeah, you can probably do more with your prayers anyhow. Any other comments? Anyone that? I mean, I guess one addition too we could make too is is uh, just to treat the seriousness of the issue, especially with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's obviously something not to be trifled with by the very fact that we've seen. Look, the as I sort of tried to use this sort of uh, image earlier, if the Holy Spirit is sort of the applicator of the medicine uh, between sort of what Christ has done for us on the cross and sort of applying it to us, um, it's a pretty dangerous thing to mess with that. Um, and this is why when we hear the Father speak, particularly about the Filioque, they speak so sort of harshly. For instance, uh, just to give you a sense of how harshly, uh, St. Photius the Great, when he interprets the the line about the sin against the Holy Spirit, which is the only unforgivable sin, essentially, he says this is the filioque. Because when we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, we've cut ourselves off from salvation, essentially, because he's the one that brings us. Uh, even with the Son of Man, there, it's understandable sometimes. It would be more understandable for one to make an error in that regard, uh, because Christ sort of came to dwell among us. He was man. Uh, man and God, and sort of in his life, we could become confused somehow. But to sin against the Holy Spirit is to just absolutely cut ourselves off from everything. We should uh, maybe get close to wrapping up, but any final questions or comments you anyone want to share? Please. possible that one would say that because the Western Church has, um, through the Filioque and their interpretation of the Holy Spirit, they have cut themselves away because unlike the Orthodox Church, uh, 
that it's the Holy Spirit that led our church, is in charge of our church, and because um, the Western Church has uh, abandoned and the Holy Spirit, so they have been guided mostly by the um, philosophical uh, works of Aristotelian philosophy, sort of, they have become almost in 2,000 denominations, and uh, practically now they are hardly believe in God or in miracles like we do, and and a lot, a lot more. But no, I, I was going to say. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think one more thing that bears mentioning too about this, just in a, in a practical sense. Sorry, I don't want to keep this going too long, but it's also important to know when we speak about the Holy Spirit. What did the What did the West do? It came up with filioque first. And then shortly thereafter, what changed? I mean, we said that what the Filioque did was undermine the importance of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that happens, the Holy Spirit is removed from the baptismal, uh, the, the sort of baptismal formula. In terms of now the priest in, in the, the Western churches, the priests say, I baptize you. It's not anyone else doing it, it's I'm baptizing. Whereas we say in the, uh, the servant of God is baptized. Um, on the other hand, too, even in the consecration, the moment of the consecration, they change so that in the West, they believe the moment of the consecration of the gifts is when the priest recites Christ's words. We believe that the moment of consecration is at the epiclesis, when the Holy Spirit is called down to transform them. Um, so those are important things to keep in mind, too, in terms of practical things that switch very quickly after the schism. Which shows us that if we, if we ourselves don't follow the same method, then we we we'll put a replacement, right? You know, you're absolutely yeah. correct. That the, the Holy Spirit is the is the guide of the head of the church, right? He shall guide you in the knowledge of all truth. So whether it be with the West, with the papacy, you know, putting a pope, or other heretics putting other things, and to this day, modern man putting himself or her, herself as the head, right? So yeah, it's, these are these are the this is this is the healthy fear. It's just you were trying to talk about earlier that the, we we see these errors and we don't want to follow them, right? So. We follow those who follow God and and uh, do our best to struggle accordingly. And I think it's important too, just uh, like it's, again, it was something I sort of identified in the text, but that when we do this, we can actually come to the point where we can become blind so that we won't be able to recognize truth anymore either. I mean, this is the other reason why we do need to be careful. The more that we put up walls and say, me first, as opposed to the sort of humility we were talking about in terms of approaching holy things, um, it, you know, it can get to the point where we just will be incapable, and we saw that in the in the readings because half of the crowd, or how many people in the crowd, you know, were amazed by what was going on. They were hearing the praises of God preached in their language, but what were the other people saying? Oh, they're drunk with new wine. Yeah. You see, and so we were presented with these two, you know, two reactions to the grace of God, as it were. Um, the reactions of those who, you know, uh, are moved and are humbled before that and are willing to receive it uh, and are thereby transformed or purified first, as we said, and those who, uh, when presented with that, uh, don't receive it in their pride and get their back up and, you know, begin to insult. And the same thing happened with the life of Christ. You know, the miracles that he worked, whether they're in front of the, un or, you know, in front of, were in front of everyone. Some people believed. Some people said, oh, we really got to kill this guy, you know, and, and they were the same miracles, though, that people were seeing, but the people were having two different reactions to them, and I think, uh, I think that's sort of significant in terms of what Father John is saying and, uh, and Nico is saying in terms of um, don't wait, don't say what does that little thing matter now, because eventually it won't be a little thing anymore, and it, it could be a really big consequence for us in the end. That's why the spirit of humility is so important. You know, we're talking about the, the drunkenness, right? You know, we're to be spiritually sober. And I remember a funny expression from Elder Paisios where there was an alcoholic that came and visited him. And he said, Elamazimo, come with me so we can get drunk together. He's looking at what he's drunk in Christ. So he goes, because when you get drunk, you lose yourself. But when you get drunk with Christ, you find yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, the disposition the Father's talking about, you know, some of the people there, yeah, they had a good disposition. They glorified God. The others, oh, these guys are drunk. And that's why St. Peter had to speak. To, it's, it's midday. I want to offer this real quick quote here from St. Ambrose with the, with the, back to the Ephesians for the, for the Feast for, for Holy Trinity. He who is inebriated with wine 
totters and sways. He who is inebriated with the Holy Spirit is rooted in Christ. And so glorious is ebriety, which affects sobriety of mind. Because sometimes you think, how can these people not see it? Are they drunk? <laughs> right? The wrong type of drunkenness, right? When we're drunk in the Holy Spirit, for lack of a better expression, we recognize truth. That's a scary thought because some of these things are so... The miracles, think about St. Spirit on, the First Ecumenical Council, like that miracle wrought right in front, you know, a bold miracle right in front that nobody ever seen before or after. Still, you wouldn't recognize that, right? So it's the disposition, so we can learn from these examples. Fathers? Again, not being afraid, but yeah. approaching God with a spirit of humility to, to guide us and illumine us. Remember uh, what Father Simeon said, who are those that become deluded or deceived? Those who want to. And the way we demonstrate wanting to is through hard-heartedness and uh, through pride and not willing to, to humble ourselves. So, Anything else, Father John? Yeah, I, I think just one other thing really quickly, too, that's important to keep in mind so that we don't get a bit discouraged. Um, partially because of the way we've spoken about it, we sort of set up a, a sort of neat little system where... You know, uh, Christ does his work on the cross, the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit then, if we have sort of purity of soul, applies uh, what Christ has done to us, and, and we find union with God and salvation. Um, the reality is that it sometimes works a little bit back and forth. Um, it's not all neat and tidy. We don't become perfectly purified, perfect temples of the Holy Spirit, and then we go straight to paradise. What often happens is we work little hard, a little bit for a little while, and the Holy Spirit sort of visits us in a small way, and that provides us with some encouragement, and we lose that grace. Uh, maybe, you know, we fall again, and then we work a little bit to get it back, and so it's a back and forth, but each time that fire visits us, uh, it leaves a mark on our soul and encourages us to go to the next step. And so it's not a linear thing. It's not like dot, 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 and we're done. It, it's going to be a back and forth, and there's going to be moments when we were sort of visited by grace and moments when we lose grace. You're and so, uh, you know, don't be discouraged. Don't expect it to go like one, two, three, four, <laughs> five. It's going to go one, two, two, three, three, two, two, two. It's going to be yeah. a back and forth thing. So what I call the spiritual kalamatiano, the spiritual Greek dance, back and forth, back and yeah. forth. <laughs> you know, Aldo Paisos, again, uh, he's coming to my mind, so I, I've mentioned it real quickly, that, uh, you know, he, he says about how God works in terms of the grace and the Holy Spirit. He goes, it's like this. We, across the, from the bookstore, Fathers, we have a be very beautiful book. Um, uh, bakery and, and uh, they have a lot of sweets. So next time you come, we'll have to get you. But at any rate, he says it's like this. God plays a, a, a little game with us in a good sense of the game. He says, you know, it's like you go to Serrano's across the street and everything's free. So you walk in, you grab your baklava, you're eating all the time. So that lasts for a period of time, let's say a period of months. And the next day, the owners are going, listen, you know what? Uh, you've had all the free stuff. You enjoy everything that we have. From here on in, you got to pay. <gasps> What do you mean? <laughs> I kind of am used to that. So same thing God does with us. He gives us the Dorian Khari, the free grace that we did absolutely nothing for, like nothing at all, you know. And then we get used to it. And then, as Father mentioned, the grace leaves. We sin at times as well, and then we struggle for that because we had that taste, right? So not to be discouraged. It's okay. Oh, now I, I like that sweetness, right? In this case, the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. I just want to add that real quick. Mm. Very good. Should we end with prayer then, or any last thoughts? We're probably about, about up for time. I think. Yeah. Well, you know, I just wanted to read real quickly, and then, fathers, if you want to end with a prayer, but again, the, the, the two hymns uh, that we haven't even mentioned, real quickly. Blessed art thou, O Christ, our God, who has shown forth the fishermen as supremely wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit, and through them didst thou draw the world into thy net. O perfender of man, glory be to thee. Right? So the fishermen. Why did Christ go to the fishermen? Right? Because there's simplicity of heart. A right? So yeah. Show us that example. Right? Mm. The beauty. And then the, the, the contacion for the feast. Once when he descended and confounded the tongues. Remember how they, they were building and they, they wanted the, 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 the term we have today, the Tower of Babel? Right? confounded the tongues, the most whole high divided the nations. And when he divided the tongues of the fire, he called all men into unity, and with one accord we glorify the All Holy Spirit. 
So we see what's the proper way to approach God, right? To build our tower or to build it through humility and obedience to the church. Right? Because obedience to the church is obedience to Christ. And going back to about delusion, Elder Joseph says those the only person that needs to fear delusion is the one who's disobedient. So if we're obedient to the church, we're struggling at least to be obedient to the church, we fear not delusion. Right? And God isn't isn't waiting there to pounce on you when you make a mistake. He's there like a father trying to encourage you even through your mistakes. So it's not like he's trying to catch you. You make one wrong step. No, there's, no, there's no fear that way. With this kakon anaf kalu, there ain't anything bad without anything good coming out of it. So the way that we deal with it, that's what we need to do. So Reverend Fathers, if either of you want to finish with a prayer, we, we would appreciate your blessings. All right. Go ahead, Father. Father. Our regular one, which is still very nice. <laughs> o Christ, the true light, who enlightenest and sanctifiest every man that cometh into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may see the unapproachable light, and guide our steps in the doing of thy commandments through the intercessions of thy most pure mother and of all thy saints. Amen. Amen. Thank you, fathers. We really appreciate it, and God willing, uh, sometime next week, and we'll see how we will continue. Thank very you. Very good. That's good.